Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back to our usual members only Lunch and Learns. We really appreciate you maintaining your membership to the Florida Native Plant Society, which allows us to do our very important mission work to preserve, conserve, and restore the native plants and native plant communities of Florida. And without further ado, I turn it over to Brian and Lily. Hello, everyone. I'm Brian Pelk. Restoration Project Manager for the North Florida Program of the Native Plant of uh, Native Plants of the Nature Conservancy. Got my uh, logos mixed up in my head. And um, part of uh, part of that responsibility brings me to the Apalachicola National Forest, where I manage invasive species and ground cover restoration on the five hundred seventy-five thousand dollar five thousand five hundred seventy-five thousand acre uh, federal property in the eastern portion of the Florida Panhandle. And hi, I'm Lily Anderson Messick. I am the director of North Florida programs for the Florida Native Plant Society. So I also thought it'd be kind of fun today since this is a lunch and learn and I assume everyone's got their brown bag lunch that uh, in the chat, uh, if you can list all the exotic plants that are in your lunch today, maybe that's wheat or apples or you know, whatever. We could, we could see a, a fun live cast of all the ingredients that are um, bringing you a, a healthful lunch today. But what we're actually here to talk about today is uh, cooperative coke and grass management in the Eastern Florida Panhandle. Um, we are going to be talking a bit about some of the background information on invasive species. Um, we don't want to assume anybody has, you know, a working knowledge. So while some of this may be introductory um, and, and, um, and, you know, infor information that you've heard a hundred times before, just bear with us. And then ultimately, um, we're going to be getting to uh, a bit of an observational study that Lily and I kind of conducted together a little back back of the envelope uh, data collection in a couple of spots on the Apalachicola National Forest that I've been observing uh, for at least the last seven years and um, and have really been inspired by the resilience of the forest to reoccupy the space that that coat and grass was in um, after we were able to get it down into maintenance control. And this isn't a story that we hear a lot of. Um, oftentimes invasives are kind of couched as this you know, a, a looming thread, a, 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 an issue that we don't really have a, a great solution. And, and, and that's certainly true, but I think where we can find little um, success stories, we should shine bright lights on them and, and also be looking at them from a scientific perspective as to, you know, what are the driving forces that are creating these success stories and how do we replicate them at scale? So we're gonna jump right in. A uh, little bit of background information on uh, plant invasion science uh, definitions and, and some common characteristics just so that we all have kind of a working knowledge together. Um, a good definition that I've seen in a, a number of different papers and, and one that the Nature Conservancy endorses has these sort of three characteristics uh, that are required in order for a, a plant to be considered invasive. Uh, first of all, exotic, meaning not from North America or not from Florida or not from the Eastern Panhandle, depending on how specific you want to get. I think that one's a little bit up to um, the individual with how uh, precise one wants to be. But certainly for us here in, in Florida, um, we would consider it at least regionally, um, not native to the Southeast or not native to Florida would be um, you know, the kind of precision we're looking for. And then naturalized, meaning that it's able to persist without cultivation without the care and, and, and maintenance that a, a person would need to bring. So they're able to you know, survive out in the wild. And then lastly, expanding. So this is where these plant species um, begin to impact the ecosystems around them because with this sort of uncontrolled expansions um, of naturalized plants, you know, the, the space that was available to natives gets smaller and smaller as, as these um, species start spreading. Some other common characteristics that I think are, are important to think about, but certainly not all necessary, and, and some of them play a bigger role than others, depending on what species we're talking about, include um, the fecundity. So, how, you know, that, that's a term for how, how reproductive an individual species is. So how many seeds do they make or how, how easily are they able to cross? You know, are they, um, you know, do they need a, a male and female or can they, um, can they self? Uh, competitive, meaning um, you know their flexibility in in being able to expand in ecosystems that vary from really dry to really wet or really hot to really cold. Uh, enemy escape, which is a real common one for invasives, and a, a sort of a, a um, I think a, a theory or a philosophy that many of us uh, can point to, where you know in the native environment that that species has, there are diseases and and predators and herbivores in this case. Um, that help limit the spread of those populations. And when they got moved away from where they originally came from, you know, they escape from those, those normally uh, population controlling pressures and they're sort of free to expand as needed. 
Um, oftentimes they're able to occupy vacant niches. Uh, so when we get disturbance like construction, um, road or land clearing, things like that, um, the first things to move in are, are pioneer species. And, and many times when we have invasives, they kind of qualify as both a pioneer and, and an exotic at the same time. And then the last one is uh, one that uh, a friend of mine, Doria Gordon from the Nature Conservancy kind of pioneered uh, back in the, in the 80s and 90s is this idea that <clears throat> when they move into an ecosystem, they're not just sort of a, um, you know, a, a neutral force, that they're actually affecting the way that the ecosystem functions. And then that can have a really broad effect on, on the other uh, community members there. And in this case with coke and grass, um, it's a, the, the impact on, on fire uh, the way that it burns, the heat that it produces affects almost everything else in it, which makes it really sort of an existential threat uh, to longleaf pine and other pine savannas that, that are here in, in Florida. Um, another thing I wanted to point to, and actually we can, we can roll to the next slide here because there's a little bit of a duplication there, um, is uh, this question about how did they get here? And I think um, we've all heard a lot of stories about you know, ship ballasts bringing in you know, mussels and, and that there's this sort of accidental, uh, you know, came in on packing material or whatever. But when we look at the, the, at least the species really common here in Florida, um, the vast majority of them are, are intentional transports. So unfortunately, um, we don't really get to avoid, I think the responsibility here by, by pinning it on an accidental hitchhiker. Um, we, we have many, many examples of, of um, intentional transport. Somebody thought it was a good idea at the time, and it turns out you know, with, with, with the years going by and, and um, species adapting to these new environments that, um, that they're bad actors, and we don't find that out until it's too late. Um, a good example of that is you know, kudzu, where it was brought intentionally as a, an erosion control and, and very quickly escaped uh, cultivation and became a, a pretty nasty actor. And uh, coconut grass is, is kind of a combination of the two. Uh, there are at least five different examples of coconut grass coming into the, uh, the United States um, starting in the early uh, 20th century. And uh, some examples include as packing material uh, coming from Asia, um, you know, I've, I've heard the story that that porcelain that was being imported, you know, was in a, a you know packing crate that had coconut grass lining it, and uh, that's how it got out. But also intentionally and actually um, endorsed by the USDA as a, a potential uh, forage for for ungulates, for you know cows and and uh, agricultural animals, and then also as erosion control. And it, it actually is, is quite terrible at both of those things. So a little bit of uh, foresight would have probably gone a long way in avoiding the situation that we're in now. And I really, I quickly wanna go through this uh, invasion curve because this kind of gives a little bit of the background biologically of, of why these are issues. You can see down on the X axis, we have time. And on both of the two Y axes, we've got the acres infested going up as well as the cost going up. And so over time, you can see this little dotted curve that, that starts out with the introduction um, and, and small scattered locations, at which point eradication is, is still sort of feasible. It's still something that we could accomplish if everybody knew you know, where to focus uh, resources and, and if we had the technology in order to do that eradication, then it's still feasible. But, but pretty quickly after that, if we, if we wait too long, then it becomes eradication unlikely and, and then local control and management only. Um, many of our worst offenders uh, invasives wise are, are well you know, into that. Um, management only uh, location, and, and I think coconut grass counts as that. However, I do think that does still give us an opportunity to think about prioritizing where we uh, focus our efforts and keeping really great places great, and that is definitely still feasible. And I think um, some of what we saw out on the ANF is a really great example of that. That you know we're not we're not really planning on never seeing coconut grass again, but if we can keep it to a dull roar in the places that we really care the most about. If that's all that we can afford to do, um, then that's what we should do. And and if we're so you know if we're so uh, luxuriously inclined that we can treat every coconut patch everywhere in Florida, that would be amazing. But I think many of you know how vast uh, some of these coconut grass uh, locations are, and some of the challenges land ownership wise about getting to them um, makes it kind of complicated. Okay, okay. I'm going to skip forward a little bit to talk about coconut grass, but. First, I wanted to mention a few a few more definitions. Um, when we call a plant native, we mean that it evolved in in its native ecosystem, right? It evolved here, and it plays importantly a functioning role in that ecosystem. 
we never call native plants invasive. We just call them aggressive if they are aggressive, um, but they're not invasive because they are still playing a functional role in the ecosystem. Invasive plants um, are a real threat, not just because we dislike them. Um, they are, are an existential threat even to human life on Earth, if, in my opinion, in many people's opinion, um, because they throw a wrench into our functioning ecosystems. And human beings depend upon ecosystems that function for a variety of what we call ecosystem services. And those include all of these benefits that we may not even think about, but that we depend on for our own survival. And those things include fresh air, um, clean air, clean water, decomposition, um, the buffering of extreme weather systems, uh, carbon sequestration and, so and storage, pollination and food production. All of these things uh, are what human life depends on in, um, on this planet. And so when invasive plants appear in a, in a ecosystem that they did not evolve in, they have no natural checks and balances and they can, many of them can quickly become a major hindrance to the functioning of those ecosystems. And why that is, is because they replace our native plants and native plants are the basis of our food webs. And uh, native plants turn the energy from the sun into food for the next level of the food web, which is insects. And insects are so incredibly important for wildlife. And so when invade, invasive plants replace our native plants, our native insects are not capable of using them because they didn't evolve with them. And that means that we are essentially starving out our wildlife because the insects are really the basis of the, the food system for wildlife. And so um, that's a real problem. Um, <clears throat> Coke and grass in particular, um, one of the reasons that we're having a whole talk specifically about it is because it's incredibly threatening in exactly that aspect. It is a, um, just incredibly aggressive and very um, uh, capable of achieving intense monocultures. It has allelopathic chemicals that prevent the um, growth of other plants around it. And that's why when you do see it, you often see nothing else growing within a patch of coke and grass. It grows extremely thickly, extremely close together. And it also uh, spreads very rapidly and pushes, just pushes everything else out. Uh, so it originated from Southeast Asia, but at this point it has spread to every continent in the world and it is uh, considered one of the world's worst weeds because of this incredible ability to be so aggressive and so adaptable. It's very adaptable to all sorts of um, climatic areas. So it's, it's incredibly adaptable to different soil types including different levels of pH. It also can adapt to wetter soils or persist in very, very dry soils. And it grows in full sun as well as persisting in full shade. So um, it spreads by underground rhizome. And these rhizomes uh, can have extensively deep root systems that can be up to four feet deep in the soil. So that makes mechanical removal or digging of it very ineffective. And those uh, rhizomes spread extremely quickly. And it also spreads by these little fluffy seed heads that can be airborne when they um, bloom. Also, one of the other issues that is such a, make it so detrimental is that it's a fire adapted species. And many of our ecosystems in Florida are also fire adapted. But as we mentioned, it didn't evolve here. It evolved in an area that has a different ecosystem. And it burns when it does burn. Well, for one, it's highly flammable. And one of the common names for it is actually petrol grass because just a spark can apparently ignite a population, which makes it really dangerous if it is around you know, human habitation. 
And when it does burn, it burns much hotter than our native fire adapted ecosystems do. Our native grasses don't, burn. it burns about 10 times hotter than our native grasses. And so it has, because it burns so hot, a population over, a time, over time burning very often can kill mature trees. And it also sterilizes our native seed bank in the soil. So further preventing, you know, more, um, more native plants from growing. Uh, anything else you wanted to add, Brian? Oh, vectors, um, if you could talk about that. Sure, yeah, happy to. And I, I do think it's also worth kind of reiterating this idea about pine trees dying. I think a lot of people think, well, you know, I mean, pine trees have this, especially fire adapted pine trees. We've got a lot of uh, slash pine and, and longleaf up here. And, you know, they've got this thick bark and, and you know, they're, they are adapted after millions of years of, of being in fire. But, but those adaptations come at a cost. And so, uh, you know, a native species, I think, with rare exceptions, don't tend to evolve capacity well beyond their need. And so when you introduce a, a stressor like this temperature that's, you know, up to 10 times hotter than native, uh, you know, that cambium, that cork uh, just simply isn't, it isn't built to, to withstand that. And so what we do see is, you know, after regular fire, which is something that we want to encourage, of course, I mean, and part of this talk is the idea of sort of mixing these different sort of progressive managements, including regular prescribed fire. Um, you know, we're kind of in a competitive environment here where, you know, we want to be burning as much of this acreage as we can, but where Kogan grass is there, it's also using that as, you know, is sort of leveraging an existential threat um, with our good management. So all the more reason that we want to keep them small or try and get rid of them altogether. Um, some of the vectors that we see on a, on a big piece of property like the Apalachicola National Forest that has a lot of dirt roads is, uh, is the, gr the grading and the mowing of the, of the, uh, the edges of the roads. You know, little tiny pieces of rhizome can get can get pulled up out of the ground by the mower blade, and then as that mower, you know, is moving along the edge of the road, you know, it's dropping off little pieces of of biological material. Some of, much of which isn't going to produce anything, but you know, it it only takes, you know, that that one little fraction of of uh, a piece of of uh, rhizome that drops and hits the soil, and it's open, and it's you know. It, it, it takes root. And so what we end up seeing over time is these long linear infestations that probably started as a little round patch and just got mowed and it's like a piece of Play-Doh, you know, it's just getting rolled out and moved over. Um, so uh, there is sort of a, a footprint that we see that's this sort of a result, I think, of the, the mower or the grater. The grater is actually, you know, digging into the ground and, and moving pieces of root. And in fact, I go back something Lily mentioned about you know the, the soil and the root system. Um, I, I would really strongly discourage anybody from thinking about trying to to dig this stuff up because I think you are actually more likely to make everything worse um, than make it any better. Even though it seems logical, you know, let's get down to the to the to the core of this. Uh, you know, sixty percent of the biomass is probably underground. Um, it, it simply isn't a, a wise idea unless you know you're really are going to be able to go, you know, three, four feet down and, and somehow bag up all that material and, and put it in the middle of a landfill or something like that. So really dealing with this from the top down is, is sort of the only sort of reasonable approach. Um, other vectors, uh, real quick, another big vector that we've got on the National Forest is, is fill dirt. And that's, you know, whenever a culvert gets built or, um, you know, a, a new facility is being constructed or new roads are being constructed, that, that especially clay fill dirt is being brought in uh, to help sort of pack in the soil and add structural material. Well, we have a number of, of what are called borrow pits, which are sort of the, the, the locations where this fill dirt is coming from um, that are completely infested with coconut grass. I mean, we, we have no doubt that it's getting moved around um, in, in uh, you know, dump trucks all over the state. And, you know- Which is technically illegal, correct? It is, right. This is a federally listed noxious weed. Um, certainly moving it across state lines is a, a federal offense, but, you know, within the state moving it around, uh, the Florida Department of Ag is responsible for enforcing that, and you know that that is perhaps a different discussion about why, you know, nothing's being done on that. But a number of these borrow pits that are on the Appalach, you know, we have regular dialogue. The Nature Conservancy has regular dialogue with those vendors um, about managing their coven grass, and you know, it, it it there's carrot and stick philosophies, you know, that we've brought to to both sides of it, and frankly, I don't know that much of it has made a big difference, but certainly. Um, I would encourage anybody that's going to be buying fill dirt or, you know, doing disturbance in their yard and, and bringing in any kind of material to really be cautious 
um, think about how you can hold a vendor accountable um, in case you do have an infestation. Because once it's there, uh, it's really difficult to get rid of. I had I had a friend down in Central Florida that that runs a, a native nursery there, and you know he he has told landowners before that have big infestations that they maybe sh maybe should just consider selling their house instead of trying to trying to remedy the the problem. So um, just to give you an idea of how bad it can be. But um, and then uh, current extent, you can see this distribution map. Uh, down in the in the bottom of the the slide here that shows you know Florida basically overrun um, major parts of Georgia Mississippi Alabama um, and then going up the eastern seaboard it becomes what we call an early detection rapid response species so not quite so abundant but where they see it they do still have that opportunity to eradicate whereas you know in Florida we just have such a massive amount of it that we really have to prioritize where where we want to try and sort of draw a line in the sand and and uh, stake it out. Yeah, so I first, you know, became aware of Kogan grass because I was at a Native Plant Society meeting, my local Magnolia chapter, and Brian happened to be there and be what and mentioned um, uh, he was asking our members to uh, identify and report Kogan grass populations. And a few years later, I, well, I started really noticing it around town and seeing it spread or on roadsides around town. And then a few years later, I drove down for a bike race in the Fakahatchee Strand. And on my way down, I took a lot of, you know, highways uh, that were kind of more scenic than the regular roads. And I was just uh, astonished at the spread of Kogan grass throughout the state of Florida and just fields and fields of Kogan grass. Um, so I'm going to go through a little bit about identification because as Brian has mentioned, early detection for new populations is extremely important because one of the one of the real issues about why one of the problems about coconut grass and really lifts it above other invasive species issues is that it's so difficult to control and eradicate it takes multiple years of herbicide treatment to try to get a handle on these populations so here are a few identifying features of Kogan grass. The first one um, that is the most easy to spot when you're up close is this kind of, you can see this prominent white midrib in my hand that I'm holding on, in that picture on the left. And the midrib is off center, which is unusual. And I don't believe uh, someone out there might can correct me, but I don't believe we have any native grasses that have off center midribs like that, especially not that noticeably. And the edges of the, the leaf margins are serrated. And when you pull down on the edges, it can actually cut you. It's, they're very sharp. Also, one of the um, ways I identify it, even when I'm driving on the highway at like 70 miles an hour, I can spot a Kogan grass population because of its growth habit. Most of our native grasses are what we call bunch grasses. They have a habit of grow growing from one main basal cl cluster and then the leaves, leaf blades come out kind of like vase shape from that cluster. Kogan grass is different in that it has an underground rhizome and the leaf blades come up from the rhizome in, in very small clusters. And so it has a very like vertical look to it. The populations look very vertical and upright. It can look different in different, um, in different settings. So if it's in sun, it tends to have this bright, almost neon green coloration, which is also another key way of spotting it at high speeds on the road. But when it's in the shade, it's often less dense. You don't see, see it grow quite as densely. It can get taller, up to five, six feet tall, the leaf blades. And the leaves are gonna be a darker green when they're in a shady area. Um, anything else you wanted to mention? Brian? No, we, we have struggled with identification, you know, in communicating it to staff. I mean, obviously, the Nature Conservancy is responsible for invasives on the National Forest, but we really rely on U.S. Forest Service staff to be our eyes and ears, and a lot of the fire staff are out, you know, in, in places that I don't get a chance to get to that frequently, and and we basically need an army of eyeballs out there keeping us uh, updated, and so I, it, it is part of our mission to communicate to, to those folks 
you know, this identification piece. And, and we have actually run into issues um, even with well-trained botanists um, unable to separate out toad and grass. And specifically in this case, it's still grass from rutans or yellow Indian grass that can sometimes look like it's got a mid vein that's a little off center and it kind of has a very similar sort of proportionality that coat and grass does as far as the, the blade width and height and, and whatnot. And we did have one, one circumstance where we actually had to send off tissue sample to UF and get it genetically analyzed and determined that it was not coat and grass, it was actually the Indian grass. But, but I think some of that is local adaptation. Um, another big issue that we run into out in, in flatwoods is that um, a coat and grass infestation in a palmetto uh, savanna area is really hard to find um, because the tips of the coat and grass actually look just like an individual tip of a, a, um, a, a, a palm frond. Yeah, so, that's um, another thing I failed to mention, which is they taper to a sharp point at the tip. They, the width of the leaves is it's not very wide; it's less than an inch wide, and then but it tapers again down at the base. So it's widest in the middle and then comes to a sharp point at the top. And even I think on a great day, if we can get to most of that stuff by, you know, sort of rooting our way through a palmetto to find, and, and they're all over the place, sort of nested within these palmettos, um, we are certainly missing some of it. And it, it's sort of a, a, a little bit of a slap in the face that, that these beautiful palmettos are actually acting like refugia for this coat and grass uh, that we, you know, can have a hard time. Um, piecing it out, sort of separating them out. Fortunately, the palmetto doesn't really seem to respond too terribly to the herbicide. So in many cases, we just kind of go over the top of the whole thing and the coat and grass usually, you know, takes a good hit and the palmetto does just fine. Um, otherwise, so, no, I think, go so ahead. By far, it spreads the most from, from mechanical spreading, from either mowers or graders, as mentioned before. Um, it, it spreads mostly asexually. Uh, and, but it does flower in, you know, the summer, and you can see here in the photo on the right, these fluffy seed heads that come up, and it, those seeds are airborne, and so they, they don't seem to spread aggressively by seed at this point. Um, they do lack a lot of diverse, individual diversity, because um, if you want to talk about that, Brian, you can. Yeah, we've, I've got a slide ahead that's got some of the oh. genetics in it. So we'll, we'll jump to that. No, I think that's good. Yeah, here we go. Okay, excellent. Yeah, I did, I did just want to touch on some of the recent research. Um, this was just a, a quick Google Scholar search that I did. So I encourage anybody that's interested to see where that kind of front edge of the, of the science on Kogan is. But both of these uh, publications sort of had a tangential relationship to what we're talking about. The one on the left, this Lucardi uh, 2020 article shows some of the genetic diversity. You can see there's a, a Mississippi type and an Alabama type. And here in Florida, we have predominantly either the Alabama type or a mix of the two. It's really only Mississippi that's got that particular type. But I think some of the understanding of this very low seed viability and thus the really high proportional amount of asexual reproduction and thus sort of the way that the mechanical um, is spreading this around has to do with this genetic um, sort of monotype that we've got in, in the Southeast. Um, Cogan grass is an obligate outcrosser, which means that it cannot self-pollinate. And I think in many cases when an individual uh, you know, flower receives pollen, you know, it, it seems that the genetics are so similar that the, the seed viability is very, very low. You know, there, there will be viable seed, but I, you know, I'm told it's somewhere in the, you know, five to 10% range. So if you have, you know, just a massive uh, infestation of it that's flowering, a little tiny bit of that is probably, you know, floating in the air, but largely we're dealing with a terrestrial issue here. And that, that really does bear out with where we see infestations out on the national forest. We don't tend to find random spots well off the road, disconnected from other Kogan patches. It's usually roadside and it's usually, you know, like I mentioned earlier, spread out from what was probably an original infestation that then is getting sort of dragged out and moved around. Um, and where we have had occasional uh, infestations that are well off the road. I actually took a sample of seed from a spot like that and tried growing it in my kitchen in a pot and I couldn't get anything to grow. And then later found out that that spot probably came in 
uh, on heavy machinery that that was part of a forestry operation in that stand. So there was, you know, there was a, a reasonable story behind that. But um, this idea about this sort of genetic differences, the, these two different uh, genotypes will come up in a second here. When, when that idea of the Mississippi versus the Florida, Alabama populations first kind of floated up a couple years ago, you know, we realized that here in the Panhandle, we could be playing a really important role. I'll, I'll describe this in a little bit, but you know, you can imagine we've got already Florida, especially the the, um, the peninsula of Florida, really super loaded uh, with these very large infestations. In the Panhandle, it's it's still it's still much less than a lot of other parts of Florida. So if you it, like Lily was saying, if you've driven some of these rural highways and just seen acres and acres of cone grass, we we don't really have that big of a problem up here. We still have an opportunity to keep it under control. And I'll show a map in a second that's got um, individual uh, locations that have been noted uh, here in the Panhandle area. But it seemed like we might serve as a buffer in keeping these Alabama, or at least the, the Mississippi genotype and the Florida Alabama genotype from crossing and thus you know, keeping that seed viability really, really low. I think the, the general conventional wisdom right now is that we've already got plenty of mix um, and, and that hasn't really borne out. We haven't seen the seed viability shoot through the through the roof. So perhaps it's, you know, all for nothing. Um, the other uh, article that I wanted to point out here had to do with, with its allelopathic effect. Um, this was a study comparing uh, uh, rice paddies that are either infested with coconut grass or not infested. And then they used this um, biochar as a way to sort of absorb this ferulic acid, which is the sort of specific chemical uh, that's been identified that coconut grass is able to emit in the soil that helps uh, minimize competition. And you know that's that's maybe the sort of a mechanistic way that coconut grass is able to occupy so much space and and limit competition. So both both of those related to to what we're seeing here in Florida. But I encourage anybody, there's lots of good work going on uh, around coconut grass, um, and you can certainly jump right to the front edge of that with a little bit of time. So here on a map on the left, I want to talk a little bit about some of our partnerships that I think are really key in being able to, to manage these coconut grass spots uh, effectively. The map on the left shows uh, what we call ARSA, the Apalachicola Regional Stewardship Alliance. That's the red boundary that kind of looks like the shape of, of the state of Texas, um, mostly in Florida, but it does cross over into southwest Georgia and southeast Alabama. And ARSA, which part of my responsibilities at the Nature Conservancy is, is the coordinator of this, is an overarching partnership alliance uh, that goes well beyond invasive species. We do a lot of longleaf pine restoration. Uh, we have a, a ecosystem restoration team at the Nature Conservancy. It's basically a fire team that's able to go out and help our partners. Um, other signatories to our ARSA memorandum of understanding, uh, understanding include um, all of the land managing actors that, that you would normally think of, US Forest Service, US Fish, FWC, DEP, Water Management Districts, uh, Florida Forest Service, and the Nature Conservancy and Tall Timbers are the two uh, NGOs that are in, in, involved in that also. And basically the idea is that uh, however we can, we try to ignore the fences that separate our properties. Um, and on this map, you can see the sort of greenish layer are all the public conservation lands. Um, and we are really blessed up here in the Panhandle to have an abundance of connected conservation lands. This area that includes the Apalachicola National Forest uh, and Tate's Hell State Forest, which is right down on the coast, uh, crossing Franklin County, Liberty County into Wakulla County. Uh, that reaches over and touches St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge. Then it goes up the Oscilla River where Oscilla WMA is managed by FWC. So we have, we have nearly a million acres of connected and in many cases, really high quality uh, longleaf and, and slash pine habitat up here. A lot of it's really connected. These are you know, really important concepts for us when we think about climate change and connectivity, species migration, all that kind of stuff. So, um, and what I wanted to point out on this map is all of those little red dots are actually reported Kogan grass um, locations. Many of these are reported uh, through Ed Maps, which we'll talk about in a minute. So they are reported by, by regular citizens. There are certainly data gaps. But the pattern I think is accurate, which is that you can see on sort of the Eastern side uh, of this ARSA polygon, we have lots and lots of, of individual spots. And then further West, even reaching out of the ARSA area, we have lots of spots. But this hash marked area between Gadsden, Liberty and down into Franklin counties has very few. And, and partly that's because these are low population, you know, relatively rural counties. But half of that space in that hash marked area is public conservation land, either the Apalachicola National Forest or Tate's Hell in this case. So 
what this buffered uh, hash marked area is, is the space between the Ocklockney River and the Apalachicola River, half of which is occupied by conservation land. So we, we have a fair, you know, it's fairly reasonable to assume that those Kogan patches are known and being managed either by me on the National Forest or by Florida Forest Service at Tate's Hell. And then in the northern part, that's not public conservation land. You know, these are some pretty large agricultural properties. So we don't have a lot of small uh, private land ownership situations. We have lots of large ones. So we have sort of a setup here for an opportunity to try and keep this area between these two rivers as Kogan free as possible. Um, and I think biologically what we're seeing is these rivers are acting as sort of biogeographical barriers. Kogan grass obviously needs dirt to grow in and you know where these rivers separate um, you know either county to county there's a concrete bridge and there's concrete pilings you know there's dirt on both sides but um, Kogan grass isn't able to grow across a bridge so as long as we're not moving equipment as long as it's not the same mowing contractor for instance you know mowing on one side of the river and then moving equipment to the other side we really have sort of kept this Kogan expansion to a dull roar and what you're seeing on that very western edge is, is Leon and Wakulla counties um, right up against the river uh, where cone grass has sort of hit its limit on as far as it can go and then on the other side of the river I think we, we have we can kind of take a deep breath and our goal within ARSA and and one committee within the ARSA is our our, our cooperative invasive species management area uh, that's the ARSA SISMA um, one of our goals is to really focus in on this area and prioritize it so that we have this roughly 35 mile buffer, you know, right through the middle of our sisma that we can, we can really draw that line in the sand and say, you know, we're going to try and hit every single Kogan patch that's in this area, or at least find out where they are and who we need to be uh, contacting as far as management goes. So, you know, that's one of those sort of strategic opportunities that we can try and seize in on that data from citizen scientists helps us you know, get a clear idea of, of what we're dealing with. And the more like this picture on the right, uh, hurricanes and invasive plants, they don't, they don't care about our fence lines. So if we are as a, as a, as a social group, as an alliance, if we are not as nimble as, as the threat is, then, you know, we're constantly gonna be playing catch up. So we try uh, through these partnerships to try and erase those boundary lines and extend the same management effort, whether it's on a state forest or on a national forest, or even on a private landowner's property where, wherever we have uh, um, availability to do that. Some of these other partnerships I just want to mention, stewardship agreements, um, that's a relatively new concept here in Florida where, at least in this case, the Nature Conservancy acts um, as a, a timber buyer on the national forest, but instead of pocketing, you know, the profits from those timber uh, receipts, we turn those back into stewardship work on the national forest. So essentially, the national forest is able to recoup the value of their timber through the Nature Conservancy, and we turn it into things like invasive species control, ground cover restoration, isolated wetlands uh, restoration, things like that. Um, and there are other examples of that. Uh, Good Neighbor Authority is a, a great program between the national forest and the state forest, where uh, state forest staff can move on to national forests and help them uh, grow capacity and, and do more work. And there, there are lots of examples of these partnerships, but I think the idea of only being able to focus on your own piece of property is a, is a huge hindrance to being able to manage um, these sort of regional threats um, at a scale that's, that's even remotely meaningful. Okay, I did want to jump in a little bit about this TNC participating agreement. This is one that helps pay part of my salary and a couple of my colleagues um, with in three focal areas uh, that I've mentioned already that we're responsible for invasive species control on this beautiful nearly 600,000 acre piece of property, but we also do isolated wetlands restoration with a focus on flatwood salamanders and, and striped newts and ground cover restoration, which is both about biodiversity, but also about ecosystem function. So um, at least in, in longleaf pine savannas, the vast majority of the biodiversity is from the knees down. That's where almost all of the wildlife is you know, capitalizing on and, and utilizing ecosystem services like Lily was mentioning earlier. But also this is the fine fuel that creates, this is the functionality that we need. Um, Cogan grass is certainly a huge threat, but um, you know, bare ground is a huge threat too. We can't get connectivity. We can't get fire to carry across a, a stand if we don't have that wonderful lush understory of, 
you know, wire grasses and drop seeds and solidagos and all that stuff. And the, you know, the more diversity we can get there, certainly the better, but very least we're trying to aim for um, connectivity so that when, when a staff member lights a fire on a, on a road edge, it's gonna carry as far into that stand as possible. We also have some funding from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. I wanna give them some credit. Um, they help pay for our uh, North Florida ecosystem restoration team. They're the, the fire crew that goes out and helps uh, helps our partners burn, you know, regardless of whether it's uh, state property or federal property or in some cases, private land. And I wanted to also point out this map. Um, this is the sort of invasives map of the national forest. The, the brown layer is the, the federal property that is the Apalachicola National Forest, about 575,000 acres. And there are a couple of, of sort of outholdings that aren't included in this map, but this is certainly the bulk of it. And you can see the different colored dots. Uh, in this case, the blue dots as a Japanese climbing fern is, is the most abundant threat that we have. But I would say probably not the most severe threat. Um, it tends to occupy culverts and drainages and, and in the Apalachicola floodplain for sure, um, it's problematic. But it doesn't tend to occupy space that are, are super abundant or super functional um, in the way that Kogan grass does um, in these uplands, you know, spreading and replacing the good fine fuel that we need. Um, and creating this sort of fire hazard in addition. And the, the thing I wanna point out about this map is you can see a, a pretty clear pattern here where you know, the roadsides are where we have these infestations. Again, certainly data gaps, like in the regional map I showed earlier, you know, we have not walked every strip of this land, but where we have sort of reached out in, into some of these you know, off the grid spots further away from roads, we do not tend to find invasives there. So you know, while we haven't had the opportunity to comprehensively survey the entire forest, the pattern time and time again, and we've had FWC come out and do surveys, you know, block at a time, um, is that within 50 to 75 feet of the road edge, we see most of these invasives fall out. They're simply not that competitive. Um, and with, with good management like fire, we tend to filter out um, some of these invasives. Kogan grass in some cases is an exception, but as long as we can keep Kogan grass a terrestrial problem and not an airborne problem, I think we've, we've got this thing you know, somewhat on a leash and we can um, predictably find it where we have had it in the past and continue to go out there and, and spray it. I do want to pivot real quick and just a little plug for the Nature Conservancy for those of you that haven't heard of us. You know, we tend to stay a little bit below the radar. I'm sure most of this crowd has heard of us, but it's surprising how many folks uh, I run into that, that don't even know how to say it. Um, the Nature Conservancy is a 501c3 organization. We're one of the biggest environmental groups. Depending on how you uh, define that, we are the biggest. Uh, we have uh, over a million members. We have been in existence as a 501c3 since 1951. We work in 70 countries in all 50 states. And here in Florida, I just wanted to sort of highlight some of our, our focal areas, land protection. That's, that's the actual purchase of land or the purchase of, of uh, easements to, to keep land in protection. That's a big piece of the work that we do. Um, certainly our own preserves, our flagship preserve up here in North Florida is the Apalachicola Bluffs and Ravines Preserve that folks, um, if you've ever had a chance to hike our Garden of Eden Trail is, is part of that. We have a couple of other big flagship preserves across the state that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And then this cooperative stewardship idea where you know, we have staff like myself that are responsible for coordinating alliances like ARSA, like the CISMA, where you know, we bring together all of these other groups that you know, oftentimes otherwise wouldn't have um, a, a coordinator or a, a framework to work together in, and we kind of help uh, deal with that. We also you know, work in fisheries and coral and coastal and climate change and things like that, of course. So uh, diving in here a little bit on the management of the national forest. So through that participating agreement, I mentioned there are three of us that work on the national forest, at least a part of our time focused on invasive species or isolated wetlands restoration or ground cover restoration. But some of the other work that's going on in the background that I think is important in the context of invasives control, some of which is you know, working in our favor and some of which is, is posing uh, challenges. Um, certainly prescribed fire is a major piece of the, the regular management on this piece of property with a target of about 100,000 acres a year. And, and they've been doing a really good job. Um, this team uh, you know, is well-staffed. Uh, they, they get out and burn a lot as often as they can. It, it does change obviously seasonally and, and from year to year, you know, they, can, they can have some issues with drought and things like that. But a lot of this forest is managed, is managed well. 
And certainly um, some effort has been put into uh, classifying the condition, the, the, eco, the ecological condition of the different ecosystems that are on the forest and where they have really high quality ecosystems. Those are both prioritized for good management and I think a result of good management and that, that sort of feedback loop I think continues well. There are certainly places that need a lot of work and I know especially within the folks that are brown bagging it right now, you know, there is certainly room for criticism. Um, it's a big piece of property. It's got a lot of opportunities for growth and, you know, sometimes limited budgets to capitalize on that. Some of the other work that's going on in the background, this is a, this is a working forest. Um, this is about, at least to some extent, about fiber production. So we have heavy equipment moving in and out. We have roads being built. Um, we have contractors in and out all the time. And those, of course, are vectors for things like token grass. But, you know, keeping a big piece of property like this relevant, at least in our North Florida context, is at least about somewhat about fiber productivity. And um, the ANF is, I think, a good example of balancing out those different needs. Um, ground cover restoration, both improving ground cover restoration on the forest, but also serving as a donor site for ground cover restoration elsewhere. Um, in fact, this year we collected several hundred pounds of, of wonderful flatwoods uh, seed uh, to share with our partners at FWC, and they're going to be doing a restoration at Oscilla WMA with seed that came right off of the Apalachicola National Forest. So, you know, these are these are crown jewels that we can that we can both need to be responsible for and manage, but also um, offer an opportunity to sort of spread out the you know the good work and and share resources with other partners in the area to sort of lift all boats. And of course, rare species are a major driver on the forest, uh, red cockaded woodpeckers, I've already mentioned, uh, flatwood salamanders. Um, so these, you know, certain, these rare species, listed species, certainly affect management and are, you know, part of the sort of the goals uh, that the forest needs to reach uh, every year. But the ANF is doing a pretty good job. You know, this is a, this is a site where RCWs are being exported from. Um, we have many very healthy populations of red cockaded woodpeckers and, and almost every year um, there are dozens of, of fledglings that are, are shared with other parts, I think especially in North Carolina where we're growing other populations. So mostly good news for, for what's going on on the forest. As far as non-native invasives, um, you know, broadly speaking, we've got a couple of different modes that we work in, um, in-house, we do some contracting. This is a picture of some conservation corps folks uh, from Franklin County, the uh, Conservation Corps of the Forgotten Coast. They come up usually twice a year for us and we do some training with them. They learn about the ecosystem. They get, they get their state certification for herbicide management um, and they get some you know, resume patterns and, and we get some good work out of them. Um, some of the priority species that we've got for what we call NNIS or non-native invasive species uh, Coden grass, certainly, in my opinion, top of the list. Uh, Japanese climbing fern is a, a big issue as far as spatial distribution. Um, little populations of kudzu, some torpedo grass we've got on the roadsides. But, you know, the vast majority of this forest is in, in really good shape as far as um, invasive species go. And um, I think we've been able, over the course of the last uh, 10 and a half years that I've been doing this, um, at least keep the populations that we've got in check and, and haven't had any major new outbreaks. And, and that's, you know, I think in the context of a back Ground, like like Lily mentioned, you know, cone grass is spreading everywhere. So if we're not if we're not seeing it similarly spreading everywhere on the forest, I think we're doing some pretty good work. There are some limitations on the forest. Um, every couple of years, they have to do a forest wide um, environmental assessment and plan that that permits different herbicides uh, for use. And right now, the only herbicides that we're allowed to use on the forest are the three that are listed there: glyphosate, which is Roundup. Um, and Mazapir, which I'm going to be talking about a little bit more in a second, and then Triclopyr, which is typically used, um, I should add Velpar to that as well, um, both used uh, for woodies, Velpar more for um, hardwood control, and Triclopyr we typically use on things like uh, camphor and uh, Chinese tallow and things like that. Okay, uh, let's see. Oh, the other thing I want to mention is this, you know, this partnership between the Nature Conservancy and the Forest Service, in this case, through this partnership agreement or participating agreement, also allows us to manage um, some issues on private inholdings. And you can see on this map, those pink, that kind of background layer of pink, and I've got one of them circled uh, right in the town of Sumatra. Um, these private inholdings, similar to the palmetto, can act as refugia. Um, if we've got giant infestations on private land and, and we're doing everything we can on the national forest, but we can't do anything on those private inholdings, then you know you might argue that it's all for naught. The Nature Conservancy, being a partner in this in this program, uh, does allow us to do that. So we, you know, we're a private organization. We can sign liability waivers uh, and agreements with private landowners that allows us onto that property. And where we have funding to do that, we do prioritize 
um, certainly cone grass infestations that are on the forest that are not um, accessible to the Forest Service. So that's that's part of this sort of, you know, the cog that we play in this machinery partly is the access that that, <clears throat> that we're able to get onto private lands. And we've been treating some of these infestations on private inholdings right in the middle of the forest, you know, in some cases for, you know, 10 or 15 years. Okay, um, let's see, long-term recovery of coconut grass treatment. Oh, so we're gonna dive in here on a, a little bit of this observational study. So you can see the map that I've got um, on the, the top right uh, shows uh, three different locations. Well, two of them are, are really close together. We've got this 104 and 104D, and then closer to Tallahassee, we've got this one up in the corner that says 300. These are the three different locations that Lily, Lily and I went out to, just because I've been keeping an eye on these for quite a long time and, and sort of have, um, have been really inspired by how the the really great high quality in this case mostly flatwoods around these coding areas are able to kind of recoup uh, this space and, and act as both a, a good competitor to Coke and Grass, but also obviously all the other ecosystem services that they offer that Coke and Grass doesn't. So in these three different sites, um, I, there are some sort of common origins. All of them are in, you know, I would say good to excellent condition. The two that are out near Sumatra uh, on the sort of the Western side of the map are really good traditional flatwoods. The one out near uh, Tallahassee is more of a dry flatwoods, kind of an upland pine. So a little bit of a difference there between, you know, those different community types. Uh, all of them have had at least seven years of annual treatment. And that's really, really key. I would say for anybody that's thinking about some code and control on, on your own uh, property, it really is about persistence. And I think that's where in many cases um, programs fall short, that if you can't go back to that same spot in year four, and then you'd go back to it in year six and you've been, you know, you've been gone for two years. In some cases, it will look like you've never been there. That's, that's partly how aggressive uh, Coven grass is in, in coming back. And um, in many cases, we will never be able to write, you know, write these spots off and, 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 you know, pat ourselves on the back that we eradicated it. Um, we will have to go back and, and you know, fine tooth comb, try and find these individual coconut grass stems and spray them. But what happens over time is the, the effort gets much and much smaller, um, but it also gets more technical. You know, you need to have trained, uh, dedicated people that are out there really sort of combing through the Indian grass and the palmetto to find these Kogan spots and spray them. But over time, we're putting less and less herbicide out there. Um, one thing I wanted to mention about the treatment in, in the first, you know, six years or so on most, on all three of these spots, we did a real sort of typical treatment cocktail, which is 3% glyphosate or Roundup and half a percent of maz appear um, with some um, adjuvant, which is like a sticker that helps the chemicals stick to the, to the plant tissue and some dye. Um, and we did that year in and year out. And only in the last year uh, did we start sort of shifting that around and basically eliminating the glyphosate um, and just focusing on a mazapir. Um, the trade-off there is that glyphosate um, is satisfying in that it browns up the plant really, really quickly. Usually within you know a week or two, you can see the effect of your spray. But I think what we've come to realize is the mazapir is actually the active ingredient that's doing most of the real work here. And because glyphosate browns up that above ground tissue so quickly, it actually locks a portion of that amazapir in dead tissue, never allowing it to, to sort of, you know, carry down into the roots where the work really needs to happen. The trade-off amazapir is much more slower, you know, eight to 10 weeks before we even see it starting to yellow, but it that gives this plant enough time to, to transport uh, the active ingredient down into the roots. And what we're seeing is if we can be patient, then um, when we come back six months later, the effect is, is much more um, efficient. We've, we get much less regrowth um, and the duration of it is, is quite a bit longer. And, and all the last common sort of root of all these is um, all of them were basically a monoculture and, and I'll have a picture here in a second. I did wanna throw out a couple of, um, this is no by no means a plug for uh, commercially available products, but you know a quick stroll through the big box store, uh, I think this was a, a Lowe's, um, I was just basically looking for a cocktail that was as close as possible to what I've had success with in the last year. And this, this ortho ground clear, you can see, I, I have a kind of a blown up picture of the active ingredient there. And amazapir is the active ingredient and there's no glyphosate, but it is much lower 
concentration than what I use um, on the forest. This is a, a you know a 0.1% versus I use a 1% um, imazapir. And then image, which is usually labeled for um, for sedge control, is a, a relative of a mazapir, a mazaquat, I think it is, and um, and that's up at three percent. So you know, if one really wanted to try and uh, put together a cocktail similar to that one percent of mazapir, you could blend those two together. Or of course, these are all you know, we, we don't use any restricted use herbicide, so you can also get a jug of concentrated mazapir um, and make up your own mix um, at one percent. I'm happy to talk with folks about that a little bit more if you need any help with the math on that. Okay, and then jumping in uh, on some of our plots here um, on the left, in, in all three of these cases, I just want to sort of orient everybody on the left, we've got our species list. Um, and then in some cases, I've got this notable not in plot, which means that Lily and I found them in, in the area, but they just didn't happen to fall within our random plots, but they are good indicators you know, of some good natives that are coming back and, and providing some of these ecosystem services and some of this diversity. They just didn't happen to fall within the plot. But as you can see, you know, we're getting 20 plus species showing up in these areas. The photographs, you can see the one on the top is both pre-herbicide treatment and, and well before a, a, a prescribed fire um, was basically a, a monoculture of coven grass. And then uh, eight years later in 2020, it, it looks really quite nice. It's a lot of uh, bunch grasses and warm season grasses and, and wonderful uh, flowering plants. Um, and just a little bit of background on that particular spot. The first treatment was contracted, which means it's more like a broadcast. They kind of, you know, sprayed herbicide over the entire area. And then every year after that, we've gone back and done it in-house, which means that it kind of got a, a big, massive kick in the pants the very first year. And then every year after that, it was much more targeted so that it was either me and my staff or, or Conservation Corps or whatever, again, you know, fine tooth comb looking for coven grass and, and just trying to put herbicide right in those immediate areas. So the amount of herbicide that we're putting out gets less and less every year. The effort gets a little bit less because it does take quite a bit of time surveying, but the actual sort of application is quite a bit less. And ultimately we're able to get to more and more of these spots in any given day. So it is getting more and more efficient. Okay, next spot. Uh, similar, this one's uh, nearby. In this case, the top picture is after the first treatment in 2012 and after the prescribed fire that came in maybe a month after the herbicide. And that was an interesting sort of double kick that I think did have a, a nice effect on the coven grass. It really cleaned out the area, burned off all of that uh, browned up dead uh, above ground material and really sort of set the stage. And then again, eight years later, we have this really lovely flat woods. You can actually see in this picture, sort of the footprint of a, of a, a gap. You can see like we're in the trees from that picture, but we're sort of looking across this gap. That's the fire gap that the coven grass resulted in. I mean, those were all pine trees at one time that died and fell down because of the sort of repeated hot fire that came through there and resulted in this. In this case, it was about a two acre opening um, that really was just coven grass when we finally found it. Um, and then repeated treatments year in and year out. Again, the first treatment was contracted. So you can think of it as sort of this big broad, broad spectrum broadcast spray. Everything that was in that area got hit by herbicide. And then after that, we were able to kind of fine tooth comb it and, and just focus the herbicide where it needed to be. And then similarly, we've got, you know, 20 something species here that are showing up that, you know, None of these are rare species, and, and Lily, feel free to jump in here if you if you want to elaborate on any of this. But a lot of them are really great, you know, uh, workhorse pioneer species in in flatwoods that are they're relatively competitive, they're relatively flexible, um, they're good fuels. Um, we've got some grasses in here, we've got lots of good fine fuels, so it's doing both the biodiversity and functionality that I think a lot of people would think that a coding spot that's been treated year in and year out, eight nine years that it would just be so messed up that it wouldn't do anything. And I think what we see is really quite the opposite. But I do think that also relies on sort of the, the um, technical skill of going in there and, and you know, really being very uh, focused and specific. Yeah, I have to say, I was really impressed at the regeneration of native species in these plots. And it is noticeable, especially in the pa this, re this past plot we went over already, that there were some very rare species in the area, but not in the area that had been treated. The area that had been treated had a lot of native species regenerating, but they were more common species. So that's something to point out. But overall, yeah, I was really impressed. 
So then we'll, we'll beam over to the other side of the forest. This is over near Tallahassee. This is the last spot that we looked at. Again, it's had uh, treatment since 2014. So in this case, you know, we're in our seventh year. It's always been in-house. We didn't have that contracted uh, original broadcast spray out there. So it's always just been me and my team. Um, it, initially, you know, we had, we did put a lot of herbicide out. I mean, this was, this isn't, you can see in that picture on the right, it, it is another gap that was created from, you know, the hot fires that this coating resulted in. But in this case, you can see some outstanding regeneration that we're getting both, there's longleaf pine and some, some loblolly in there, but the longleaf is really what we're focused on. Um, coming up in a very traditional longleaf uh, regeneration fashion of sort of this cone of growth in the middle. And, and you know, over time, the winners are going to sort of sort themselves out. But meanwhile, in the understory, you know, a little bit less uh, total number of species here, but a lot of great workhorses, uh, both from the fine fuel and from um, just sort of the diversity perspective. I do have a couple of unknown species in there just because I wanted to make sure, you know, we, we saw some of the diversity. We just, some tiny little babies were, were hard to, to key out. But um, in the pictures on the bottom, you can see a longleaf pine uh, seedling and some dicanthelium and a, and a coreopsis. So, so really good diversity. Um, I just think it's a, a really great demonstration of how this combination of really targeted and, and I think skillful herbicide use um, as well as prescribed fire can move these spots from, you know, sort of, you know, checking them off the list and, and you know, that they're just going to be gone forever to really being a, a, an excellent example. In fact, Lily has mentioned that in this 300 spot, you know, a lot of the flatwoods around this Kogan spot are actually worse <laughs> than yeah. the spot itself. Yeah, I was going to mention the majority. So this this spot in particular, you could tell that this area had been suppressed from fire for a very long time because you have mature trees that that are not pretty nice, but it was virtually all around this one plot. It was virtually all Smilax auriculata and Carolina jessamine, uh, and and just a tangle of you know four foot high Smilax basically, and. You know, there's not a lot of species diversity in that at all. You know, there might be a few native plants hanging on, but the diversity of the <laughs> the treated the, the spot that had been treated with herbicide for you know multiple years in a row looks so much better. I was actually really shocked when I saw this spot because it it really showed you how how this can actually be a beneficial you know thing overall treatment of these spots. Okay, so moving forward, I just wanna kind of give a, a, a what's on the horizon for these sort of partnerships that we have. Um, ARSA, the Apalachicola Regional Stewardship Alliance and our, our committee, the Cooperative Invasive Species Management Area, uh, still going strong. Uh, we've, you know, we've been, we've had our memorandum of understanding uh, signed and re-signed twice now. And all, I think all of our partners are really um, enthused by the work. We're able to bring in money because of our partnership from folks like the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. We also, the Nature Conservancy got a really nice grant uh, two years ago from EPA it was a Gulf of Mexico oil spill money that we were able to turn into fire team support, but also we built this code and grass strike team. And one of the things that I mentioned earlier about this, that hash mark buffer between the Ocalocne River and the Apalachicola River, th there isn't anyone in this area other than the Nature Conservancy that's able to do work on the private landowners and public and public lands at the same time. And one thing that we've seen, especially in Georgia, uh, they have a model that has really been successful with coke and grass management, where in that state, Georgia forestry is empowered to strike uh, waiver, you know, agreements with private landowners and actually go onto their property and do spraying and more importantly, keep track on the database. So, you know, we're using this EPA money to develop a database, especially within that hash mark buffer area between the Ocalocne and the Appalachian, where we will be responsible for, for knowing where all those spots are. And in, in as many cases as we can treat them, we do have a deliverable for that EPA grant to spray 120 acres of coven grass that we will do with our ecosystem restoration team. And that's, you know, that's going to be a drop in the bucket, but maybe more important is that we will know where all those spots are and we can at least keep track so that when money comes in, we can continue to prioritize, you know, where we do spraying with, you know, distance to conservation land or distance to rare species or size of the, of the, of the um, infestation or something like that. Um, we also have an exciting uh, opportunity on the horizon with a restore proposal that the Apalachicola Regional Stewardship Alliance, um, roughly that same group of people all kind of coordinated on called ARRI um, that will have some funding for invasive species control. 
And then always, you know, the shiny thing on that's on the horizon for many of these plant species is the opportunity for biocontrol to be developed and brought out. There isn't a good biocontrol for cone grass right now, but I know that things are in the works and uh, partners out at uh, USDA and, and UF are working hard on trying to find a, a biocontrol agent that, that, that is safe to release uh, up here. And, and when that happens, I do think that'll be a game changer. Uh, we've seen it with air potato where, you know, if you can find a bug that can do the work for you, it's probably not a silver bullet, but it can bring down the pressure uh, significantly such that what's left over to be controlled with herbicide or, or mechanical or whatever is, is just much more reasonable. So unfortunately, uh, you can see in this photo here, uh, Cogan grass, although it's, you know, technically illegal to sell, it, there is a loophole that allows for cultivated varieties to be sold of invasive plants. And it is sold as a cultivated variety under the name Japanese blood grass. And it's really important to not purchase invasive plants that are considered sterile or cultivated varieties that are less invasive because they m almost always can revert back to their more, more no normal invasive selves eventually. Um, there are a few ways uh, to, to uh, report this species and it's really important for reporting for the reasons that we mentioned already, early reporting of this species in particular, it's very important, but all invasive species. And there are <clears throat> two apps that I use, iNaturalist, which many of you are already familiar with. And then this app, if you don't have it downloaded on your phone, I definitely recommend you go ahead and download it. It's called I've Got One, and it used the EdMaps uh, early detection uh, reporting tool, which a lot of governmental and non-governmental agencies use for information on managing and uh, mapping invasive plant species. Do you want to talk about how it, what happens after they're reported? Yeah, absolutely. So with EdMaps in particular, that, that, that data is all housed at the University of Georgia, and the folks up there identify local verifiers. Um, in the state of Florida, it's the Florida Natural Areas Inventory, and then underneath that layer, we have sort of more local uh, and regional verifiers, and I'm, I'm the verifier for our eastern portion of the panhandle. So if somebody, let's say, in this case, an FSU student, uh, reports uh, uh, taro, this happens pretty frequently, <laughs> a wild taro infestation on campus or something like that, that report uh, will come to me. And, um, and let me just say, if you don't include a photograph, I will not verify it. So it, assuming it's got a photograph that I can tell what it is, um, I just go through and, and make sure that the information on it is accurate and then it's released into the database and you can actually search it um, by going into EdMaps. You can do species searches so you can pull up maps of all the reported infestations. And you know, a great example of this is that that hash mark buffer strategy that we have with Kogan grass. I mean, most of those data points are on EdMaps and most of those EdMaps points were reported by concerned citizens. So you know, the more we can have people out there that know what they're looking at and are actually taking that additional step of, of actually reporting it and putting the data out there, you know, we need that information because, you know, we simply don't have enough eyes out on the ground to have a great sense of what's going on. And these regional prioritizations, like, you know, where do we want to draw our line in the sand? That really relies on data being accurate. Um, and so that we're not focusing efforts in a, in a foolish way, um, the more we can have folks out there doing it, the, the better. So do get out there, use the, the especially in my case, the EdMaps, um, those all come my way and, and verify them. If you're in other parts of Florida, um, there are others, I think generally it's SISMAs that are responsible for verifying them. So uh, if you know your SISMA from your part of the state, um, that those are the folks that are doing the work. And if you don't know them, you can uh, search uh, Florida SISMAs on the FISP website, the Florida Invasive Species Partnership, <coughs> excuse me, um, and, uh, and you can learn uh, who are the key people in your area that are, are um, involved with being uh, managing these invasive spots. But it doesn't have to be that complicated. You can, all of Florida can use the I've Got One app to report, and then it goes automatically onto the EdMaps map after it's been verified. Exactly. Yep. So, but, but I think it's good to know that somebody in your neighborhood is probably your verifier. Yeah. So it, it is sort of locally um, skill set based. Yeah. And pictures are great. And the more, obviously, the more botanical, uh, you know, clarity you can get in those pictures, the better. 
Okay, I'm not sure where we are on time. I hope we have some time left for, for questions and I'm certainly fine sticking around if anybody um, has any questions, but I did wanna close up with some, some thoughts. Um, again, we need to be as nimble as, uh, as these weeds are, as, as other threats are, like the picture of the hurricane with the coat and grass all over it. Um, otherwise, we're just tying our hands behind our backs and, and you know, they don't care about fence lines. We need to figure out how not to care about fence lines. And I really do think that takes a, a, a committee. It takes a, a group, um, whether you, you know, you're a private citizen or an academic or a land manager or an, and within land manager, whether you're a state land manager or a private land manager, um, all of these eyes are needed. And, and I think it's really important um, to recognize that we care a lot about diversity in our plants if we take that same philosophy and apply it to the diversity of our careers and see that we all bring these sort of unique skill sets and, and all together, you know, we are stronger and, and working better uh, at, at achieving our goals, um, but the faster we're gonna get these things dealt with. So open-minded, um, I really encourage everyone um, when, you're, when you're posting things on Facebook and, and you feel like throwing a dagger at your local, you know, federal uh, employee or, you know, you're critical of, of what's going on on land management. I I think there, there is room and it's important for us to be critical, but um, I'll, I'll um, paraphrase a, a colleague of mine, Cheryl Millett um, in Central Florida, that there, there has just been a lot of, of nasty commenting going on in some of these systematics, uh, Facebook groups and things like that. Just remember that your local land manager is oftentimes doing the best they can with limited resources. And uh, even if it's a matter of just reframing your comment in a positive way and thinking about how you can be um, a good actor that's that's making a difference on the land other than just you know spewing out hate. Um, that will really be appreciated. I think we all have a lot more in common um, than we think and and um, it is gonna take everybody all, all together and, and partnerships like this, um, like I've demonstrated up here at, at, with ARSA and, and with your local CISMA, you know, they really are a wonderful framework to kind of bring together different talent and focus and, and funding and time. And, and basically nature needs all of that we can give it, right? So um, focus, uh, focus on, on the positive and, and moving the needle instead of sort of dragging each other down. And, and then I think um, this coat and grass little sort of observational study that we did really does demonstrate uh, how progressive management, prescribed fire, good high quality herb, uh, um, herbicide use, um, that they can work together in tandem and, and that the forest resilience, you know, around if, if we're working in high quality uh, forested areas that, that these, these places can become part of the ecosystem services again. Um, it just takes a lot of persistence and, um, and dedication and anybody can do it. Any, what are our questions now? <laughs> Yes, so we have a number of questions. Okay. Uh, let me, can I see myself again? There we go. Okay, so everyone can see me and all of us. I'll make us a little bigger. And um, sorry to everyone, we are a bit long. Um, just to remind everyone that we have, all of these are basically live DVR'd. So I'll go back and put a little chapter marker for the Q&A. If you have to go, you can come back and see if your question was answered. So I'll try and get the questions in the chat. Um, now. So um, the first question is from Rhonda Mayo about cult your cultural practices. So we're going to have a lot of um, coconut grass management questions. Uh, she asks, are you using tillage at all or just herbicide? Um, on the National Forest, we just use herbicide. And, and I would say herbicide in combination with prescribed fire, I think like in that case where we sprayed it and a month later it got burned, that, that really was a beneficial um, extra step because it cleaned up the area. It allowed, you know, more open space for some of the natives, especially some of those pioneer floaty asters and things like that to kind of float in and, and take up some space. Um, no, we don't do anything otherwise. And, and I think part of that has to do with the scale that we're working on. Um, we've, we, if I had to guess, and I, I probably should know this number right off the top of my head, but I mean, there, there are dozens, if not hundreds of, of individual small coke and grass spots across the whole national forest. And, and frankly, um, it is just about enough for me to take up you know, the time that I have available to do that just with herbicide. And, and so, because that's the most efficient time-wise for us, and, and, and we've seen you know, really good results with it, like, like here, um, that's really been our focus. I don't think, I think tillage would not be effective with Kogan grass. If anything, it might even encourage it to respond quicker um, any kind of mechanical removal of coconut grass, like we 
or disturbance of the ground, really it it comes back gangbusters from any kind of disturbance like that. So it's just not fe a feasible option for the species. But like Brian mentioned, they use a variety of options depending on the species. Um, and, you know, herbicide is not always the first choice, but sometimes it is the best choice uh, to, to uh, treat and manage. And if we want to continue to enjoy our rare natives in these areas and have ecosystem services, we have to use the tools that work. Um, and one of the rare natives in these areas I'm going to mention is a pine lily, and this is um, Florida Native Plant Society uh, sells these shirts. So. <laughs> get your, get your pine lily shirt. Here. Your pine lily shirt. All right, yeah. I'm dropping that link in yeah. the chat in case you want awesome. your very own pine lily shirt. I, I, if I can go back real quick, I do remember, I think UF for a while there was recommending if you wanted to try and disc in between herbicide that, you know, I think the philosophy there is break up the root mat and then the herbicide, especially if it's soil active herbicide, like in this case, a mazapir is, you know, it'll have more access to that tissue. I do think that's a very, very slippery slope though, because if that piece of equipment doesn't get well cleaned, um, there's just so much more opportunity there for stuff to get moved around. Whereas, you know, just kind of keeping it whole and hitting it from the top down, and partly it's an efficiency thing for us, but I, I just don't think we have the capacity. Yeah, it further damages so, the soil structure and other, it would cause other issues, you know, yeah. below. Um, so Santa asks, like in a smaller area, if you have a small patch of clover grass, could you smother it with layers of cardboard? No. What would happen? It would grow through the cardboard as the cardboard broke down. What if you just kept putting more cardboard on top of it? It would spread wider. The, the underground rhizomes would keep going or they could, you know, they can push up through things like asphalt, you know? So cardboard, yeah. you know, is just not as a, it's no i've always been you know i would love it if you could just smother invasive plants or weeds even um that you don't want but in my experience you know i have a lot of you know vegetable gardening experience and i've tried many ways to create a, a, new, a fresh bed and smothering with cardboard or even solarizing is a little more effective black plastic but it is never completely effective. Maybe it works better in Ohio or something, but I found that in Florida, our weeds have, they often have storage roots underground that wait until um, they have the chance and then they come up. Um, and even if there's something continually there like weed cloth, they can grow right up through it. You know, they're very much stronger than we give them credit for. So in Central yeah. Florida, there is some access to these, I don't know about your area, but you can get these things that used to be on billboards, like billboard mm -hmm. covers, and you know, the plastic is maybe is a little less than a centimeter thick, and there has been some success for like Bahia grass kill. Yeah, I would, I mean, I don't know, I'll let Brian address this, but I would say personally, you know, these underground storage roots of, uh, of plant species they, they can wait for years underground until they get the opportunity to come up and, um, and catch sunlight, you know? I think that we're really, uh, we underestimate them when we try smothering them. It yeah, works I think on a lot of plants, but not on those with sto um, underground storage capacity. Yeah, I think I, I agree. And I think if you're in a situation where you have a spot that's small enough that that's a that's a feasible and efficient method, give it a shot. Um, but I do think it's important to be uh, cognizant that it's it's a it's a very challenging species to deal with. I, and actually, you know, I'm, I'm looking out my window right now. I've got a, a nasty patch of uh, Japanese climbing fern in my own backyard that I've been that I've been smothering with hay. And what I really like about hay is it kind of decomposes so that you don't have little tiny pieces of black plastic and all that stuff. And we've got chickens, so we've always got a lot of hay around. And that's actually working really well on climbing fern. I, I, I would not even bother with uh, with Kogan if I had it back there. Like like Lily said, I just think they're so persistent underground that you know you, you may you may believe that you've gotten it knocked out, and it may even be a year or more before you see it come back. But if you're not really and, and I, I do think smothering does have an impact on the roots because obviously it's not able to photosynthesize and eventually, you know, 
theoretically it would it would run out of you know money in the bank account but i just think it's it is able to persist for so so long um underground without without really needing to photosynthesize that it'd be tough to get in front of it i mean if red dogs 99 is asking so it's not a good idea i would say maybe give it a go if you're not doing any treatment and you have a bunch of cardboard do it and you know send me an email see how yeah. you, let us know how it works I would be very, very surprised if it was effective. I would say it's almost 100% not going to be effective, but you know, <laughs> worth a try, I guess, if you're not gonna do anything else. Right. Um, well, and, and actually one thing, I wanna jump in real quick. One thing that I've seen a lot around Tallahassee is a, a, the legacy of Kogan grass after people have done you know, other landscaping. So I, I, I can imagine at one point somebody thought, oh yeah, I've got this thing kicked. And then they put in a bunch of Japanese bockwoods and now cone grass is coming up through their whatever, azaleas or boxwoods or whatever. And now good luck because you, you know, now you've just really restricted the options that are available if you care about that shrub that you put in and now it's all tangled together. And Because so, the yeah. herbicides that are effective on cone grass are going to be detrimental to other plants in the area. Yeah, so if you, had, if you plant it around or if you have it growing around other plants and, you know, you can kiss them all goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> right. So that, that brings us to a couple of questions um, about the chemicals that are being used. Um, Rhonda asks, doesn't amazapir also prevent anything growing for a good amount of time? It's harmful to other plant roots. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Like, like Lily was just saying, I mean, it's a, it's a broad spectrum herbicide and that unfortunately is, is kind of what it takes uh, to battle uh, a beast as bad as Kogan. Um, but the, the time frame that we're talking about here, you know, seven, eight years, what, what we're seeing is that as we're able to refine the amount of area that's actually getting a up here um, down over time, then there's lots of space around those increasingly shrinking areas that are actually getting this. And, and to answer your question, yeah, it's, it's usually about active for, you know, six months um, and, um, and, and anything that got herbicide on it or is in the sort of the drip zone um, is going to get affected. Enough mazapir can certainly kill an oak tree or kill a pine tree. You know, we've got a couple of Kogan patches that it's hard to say whether it was the fire that killed those pine trees or the repeated herbicide, but you know, the counter argument of, of not using it, those places are, are kind of up the creek without yeah. it. So, you know, some of this is just sort of the unfortunate collateral damage that comes from trying to keep these things from getting worse and worse. Because walking away is absolutely not an option. I am, I am no herbicide lover. You know, I like to, I prefer to use, I use virtually no chemicals in my yard, you know. And when I do use them, I use them as specifically and, and, Act and you know small areas as I per possibly can. I, you want to do everything you can to prevent using chemicals, but what we come to is this point where a plant like Kogan grass, either we lose our native species because it pushes them all out, burns so hot it sterilizes the seed bed and also can kill our native trees, or we lose some of them in that area because we are treating it with a very toxic herbicide. You know, you're kind of at either way, you, you, you're, you're losing plants, native plants, but if you don't treat, you're going to and eventually lose, you can lose them all, you know? And so it's not, herbicide is never our first choice to treat invasive plants. You know, ideally mechanical removal is is ideal, you know, but that's time intensive and most importantly is not effective on Kogan grass. So that's really what we face here is a very adaptable and aggressive species that comes back so quickly, grows extremely quickly and is very hard to kill. Yeah. So uh, a couple of questions I, since we're here. Um, Sana also wants to know if you need to vary the treatment chemicals so that you don't get resistance within the Kogan grass. Um, that's a good idea. I mentioned earlier that the Forest Service has a limited suite of chemicals that we're allowed to use. And of those, Amazapir is really the only one that is effective on 
uh, Kogan grass and going, you know, l like I mentioned, the sort of one through six years where I was doing 3% Roundup and a half a percent of Mazapir, they were kind of in combination and the, and the glyphosate was, was probably more more of the active ingredient affecting the plant at the time. But like I said, it also seemed to be trapping the, the more efficient of the two um, in above ground, dead above ground biomass. So it wasn't ever really able to get down to the roots. Um, it, it's a good, it, it's a good question. It's a dilemma. Um, I, and I, I guess as, as maybe more products are available and getting tested by academia to determine whether they're useful for something like coconut grass, then we definitely should be, um, you know, focusing on a couple of different options and, and spreading out the love a little bit. Unfortunately, right now, I think Amazapir is the only one that's really proven to be all that effective. Yeah, I think one, Amazapir is the most effective. There aren't very many that are effective in the long run on it. Some of them will kill them, kill them back like glyphosate, but then it comes right back. Uh, and two, most importantly, is that, you know, this resistance is usually evolve through sexual reproduction and this plant is not really reproducing sexually it's mostly reproducing asexually through little pieces of the plant um, getting moved by vehicles and other things and so it's not having it's not going to evolve as uh, resistance as quickly as plants that are you know annual grasses would be much more likely to re um, evolve a resistance to a chemical Right, so shorter individual life cycles, right? Sexual reproduction. And the, you know, the genetic variability is less because there, there are gen individual genetic individuals that are spanning over acres and acres and acres. And so um, when you have sexual reproduction, you get a mixing of the genes and you have, you know, possibly resistant genes that might pop up. So less likely to happen with plants that reproduce asexually. Right, and we think of things that develop resistance very quickly. You know, we think of bacteria and things that have extremely short life cycles and lots of sexual reproduction. And, yeah. You know, Kogan grass is probably unique amongst weeds in that it's really difficult to control because it's so rhizomaceous, is the right word, uh, but it's not reproducing very sexually. So that's a good thought. I mean, we do need to, you know, keep in mind when we're thinking about controlling things, resistance, but in Kogan grass's case, it's not yeah, a problem. Definitely. Um, uh, Marion in Polk County, uh, she says that she's seen cone grass pop. Oh, we lost Brian. <laughs> oh, he's back. Okay. Um, back. Yay. Welcome back. Um, thank you. What is the recommendation for treating cone grass that, in that has invaded wetland edges? And she also comments that she has seen individual patches of cone grass randomly pop up after hurricanes. Yeah, there's actually a really good study from the west side of the Florida Panhandle after Hurricane. Uh, it was a while ago, so it wasn't Michael. I think it was. I don't remember. I'm bad with these names, but there was a specific study on Kogan grass spreading after you know big weather events, and and there's there's a, an obvious clear pattern that is borne out in the data. So no big surprise there. I mean, big disturbance, um, lots of equipment moving in, recovery stuff, um, all vectors. So certainly that's true. As far as your question about wetland edge, um, there are water safe labels of imazapir that you can use if you feel comfortable putting it near water. One of them is called Ecomazapir um, that is water labeled. Um, doesn't necessarily mean it's a good idea. Um, it certainly introduces an, an extra layer of concern, I think, and justified. But again, you know, balancing out, well, what if we do nothing? You know, what, what gets lost in that case? Um, so if, if you're so inclined and you want to try a appear right up to the water edge, you certainly can. I think it's really on the applicator to really be very precise and try and keep it on the tissue um, as much as you can. Um, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, the Ecomazapir chemical, once it's in the water, it, I mean, not to say that it's necessarily good for amphibians and things like that, but I don't believe it's actually active you know, as an active ingredient herbicide in the water anymore. So once, you know, if you sprayed that wetland edge, it would continue to be soil active, but I don't think it's water active. So, uh, you know, better or worse that I think that's something to take into consideration. Uh, we have some questions about 
how to, if you are a, you know, a homeowner with a small patch of Kogan grass and you, you desire to treat that, to, that yourself, do you have any step-by-step -step instructions or references that people can refer to? Yeah, certainly UF and Extension have a lot of great uh, information out there. And I think they're coming along on this imazapir notion, less glyphosate, more imazapir. But for a long time that, you know, Roundup was the was the sort of conventional wisdom. And I think we're starting to move away from that. Um, and any any of the herbicides that I've talked about are, are available. I showed you that label that you can get premix, but you can buy concentrated at, a, you know, a, a farm co-op or you can order it online. Um, that's the cheaper way to do it, but you end up buying, you know, a big old jug that is going to last you forever. Um, treatment in fall is better than treatment in spring, but treatment in spring is better than no treatment at all. So, you know, when we're dealing with hundreds of spots on the national forest, we don't tend to worry too much about seasonality, but if you're so... Um, if you have the opportunity to focus just on a certain time of year, fall is better because, you know, it's translocating all kinds of stuff from the, from the above ground into the below ground and the herbicide can, you know, catch an easy ride that way. The alternative of springtime when new shoots are coming out, um, they are tender, so they're easier to kill, but they're also fight, the herbicide is fighting against the, the tide of, you know, of, of soil and, and root uh, resources that are going into building uh, new leaves and, and above ground stuff. So definitely, um, if you have the choice, fall is better. Um, step by step, I, I, I mean, it's really just make your herbicide, spray your herbicide. And if you've used imazapir, wait eight to 10 weeks before, you know, doing anything else. Um, after that, it's a good idea to go back to your spot and make sure you've gotten it all. It'll be evident where you've put herbicide and where you haven't and to catch whatever spots you didn't. Another thing I would really strongly encourage folks to do is, is spray, you know, maybe a meter beyond the actual above ground that you can see. And I know that sometimes is, is painful because you're probably either spraying your lawn or, or, you know, in our case natives, but like Lily has mentioned, you know, this, the below ground biomass is, is quite a bit more than what you can see above ground. Yeah. And in order to keep these spots from growing, you know, you kind of have to include a little bit of a, an apron around it so that you're really kind of managing the whole thing and not missing any other. Otherwise you just get it sort of spreading out from the middle. Yeah, 60% of its biomass is below ground. I, I failed to mention that. So that can be tough. And, and honestly, for years and years, I, I hesitated to do that, especially in some of these beautiful flatwoods. It was just like it hurt my soul to be putting herbicide where I, I didn't believe it needed to be. But we were starting to see this donut effect where, you know, you sprayed what you thought was all the Kogan. And then the next year, that spot doesn't come back, but everything around it. And then, you know, it starts to spread out from there. And, and that that obviously that gets harder and harder to treat because now, you you know, your space is much bigger and they're discontinuous. So, you know, it, the alternative of, of just sort of taking care of about a three foot or a meter um, beyond what you can see above ground is, is a, a pretty good idea. And uh, Sana is also concerned that the Conservation Corps volunteers weren't shown with much protective gear and uh, that the aerosolized spray could affect the applicator's lungs. Um, you know, I don't wear a respirator. Um, we wear eye protection, longs and longs, so long sleeve shirt, long sleeve pants, gloves, boots. Um, that's what's on the label. And um, there, there's also a balance that has to be struck with uh, applicator safety from overheating and from, you know, sun protection and things like that. I, I hate wearing hard hats. I'm probably supposed to wear it a lot more than I do, but I find I overheat much more than if I wear a straw hat, which doesn't provide me protection you know, from things falling from up above, but, you know, balancing out those different uh, risks when you're spending weeks and weeks out in the forest doing it is, is something that we have to grapple with. Um, I kind of wanted to ask about, so we only have these two genetic types of Kogan grass. Is that correct? And then we have, it's, there was some like ambiguous in that one study that was showing the Mississippi and the Florida type. Well, it does seem like Florida has some areas that are seem like a mix of the two of the Alabama and Mississippi that Alabama. and and then and then mostly the Alabama here. Now, there are a couple of related species too. there. And, and I think there's some research that's still trying to figure out whether it's synonymous or not. But for a long time, there was a, an Imperata brasiliensis which now it sounds like maybe Brazil was just one of the unfortunate first infestations from, from uh, Southeast Asia. So that may not necessarily be a different species. And um, I know when the conventional wisdom was that there was a Brasiliensis down in Miami area, there seemed to be more of that 
phenotype. So it, it does seem to have a slightly different appearance, even though the genetics seem to be, you know, pretty fluid. So I think the, the jury's still somewhat out on that. And um, Bill, Lily, you were saying, I think there's a native Imperata. There is one native species that's native to the Southwest United States, but it's not, it doesn't go past Texas towards the east, so it's not here. Okay, and so these different, the Alabama and the Mississippi, are, is that indi indicative of where they're from in Africa? They're, they're, genetic, they're genetic individuals. So they, um, when, they, when they say types, when, when you say like the Alabama type and whatever type, it's, it's because it's spreading asexually. And so it's one genetic individual that is unable to um, uh, fertilize its own seed. And so it's typically sterile in the, in the effect that it's not reproducing sexually, like we've mentioned. It's spreading just by the asexual reproduction on machinery usually, um, or filter, like we mentioned. And so um, they're um, different genetic individuals, but, and for a while they thought that if we kept them separate, that they wouldn't reproduce sexually, but we've seen that there is mixing in areas. And while some Kogan seed might be viable, the majority of it is not. Okay. Thank you. And it might be because there's not enough genetic diversity in the populations because there are a few, you know, very little diversity. Okay. And I don't know much about the Mississippi genotype, but I have heard that it looks a little bit different, um, not quite as tall. And, but but I've also seen populations in Florida that look different from other populations too. So I and think a lot is, of that's just, go ahead. It's definitely a plant that looks very different in different settings. So depending on, um, you know, the sun, the shade, the soil um, pH and everything else, it, it can look the same individual plant can look very different. Yeah. And before we wrap up, I wanted to show, I, I pulled up on another browser, so you guys can't see this, Brian and Lily, but just the, the floridainvasives.org website which is the mm -hmm. website of the Florida Invasion Species Partnership, where you can find out which SISMA you're in and you can click on it. And, you know, I recommend if you have time, you can join your SISMA meetings and, you know, learn about funding and that sort of thing. Um, and then yeah. I was also wanted to show off uh, Sorgastrum nutans, the Indian grass, yeah. what, it, what it looks like, just so everybody could kind of see that the, the seed heads look significantly different, but yeah, yeah, if you've got if, if there's seed heads available, then it's a no brainer. There's there's yeah. nothing that looks like a coconut grass flower, but they are frequently not flowering. And right. I think, Lily, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think biologically they're supposed to be flowering in spring. However, we see them flowering after any kind of stress environment. So we'll see them flowering after a frost. We'll see them flowering. You know, like it'll get mowed, and coconut grass will be the first thing to come back, and it's only four inches tall, but it's immediately going to start throwing out flowers. Like it's. Yeah kind of a, a desperate last attempt to do That's some kind of reproduction. Fun. Yeah, and I've seen the area that got mowed of the Kogan grass starts flowering, you know, yeah. and th that was another thing I wanted to mention was that another way to ID it is if an area is mowed, it grows back much faster than any other grasses. And so you can often spot it if you have it in your lawn because there's this one patch that is that grows back taller much faster than the rest of the grasses in your lawn. That's right. Well, that appears but to in, be... Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Brian. I was just gonna say, it, but, but in the absence of flowers, yes, it's, it's really hard to tell them apart. And, and, and there is a difference in the ligule if, if you get out a, a lens and you can actually kind of get down to that level. Um, but there's a good bit of overlap too. I mean, the size of the ligule on a on Sargassum nutans, I think can uh, approximate the size of the ligule on a coconut grass. So it's yeah. tough. Yeah. So uh, there are, let me check the chat real quick. There are no further questions. I dropped that EDIS document, the EDIS document they have on recommendations. So you have to do some math, right? You have to, you know, pounds per acre and then purchase the recommendations and then just spray the whole mix on the whole area that you were intending on spraying. And then, um, 
that is all the questions. So just like PBS, this programming is brought to you by viewers like you. Uh, I would like to give a special thanks to everyone who contributed to our annual fund campaign for the Florida Native Plant Society. Your generosity helped us to exceed uh, our 2020 year-end $5,000 staff and board matching goal, which we matched, so thank you. And thank you, Brian, thank you, Lily, for presenting today. It's really an honor to have you guys on. Thank you, yeah. Valerie, for all your work. Thank you. Yep, and thanks to our brown bag listeners. I hope you had a good time, and um, feel free to contact us, or at least me, by email. I'm at bpelk at tnc.org, and um, best of luck. And I will drop bpelk at tnc.org in the chat. And I hope by now that all y'all have my email address. So if you have any questions or comments after, uh, please feel free to, to email me. And uh, I hope everyone has an excellent Friday and a great weekend. Yeah. Thanks. Too. Thank you. Bye-bye.